Welcome everyone to our panel discussion today on the Ukrainian war and the strategic implications for China. My name is Jia Wang. I'm the interim director of the China Institute at the University of Alberta. The University of Alberta respectfully acknowledges that we are situated on Treaty 6 territory, traditional lands of First Nations and Métis people. Our panel discussion will be followed by Q&A. We encourage our audience members to submit your questions using the Zoom Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. We have over 300 registrants for this webinar. We will try our best to accommodate as many questions as possible uh, in the second half of the program. As the world watches in distress, Russia's invasion of Ukraine continues into its fourth week. This war has shaken the existing global order established since the Second World War and has the potential of reshaping the geopolitical alignment of global powers. As Western nations appear more united than ever to confront the largest security threat in decades, China's responses have been ambiguous and evolving, with close strategic and economic ties to Russia, yet not willing to sever relationships with the West. China is doing a risky tightrope walk, trying to balance its multitude of strategic interests. I really couldn't think of a better and more knowledgeable panel of experts today to shed light on China's perspectives and how the war will affect China's relations with Russia, the United States and the West, and perhaps also the role China could play in this major conflict. I'm so delighted today to introduce our speakers um, we will first hear from Professor Olga Alexeva, Associate Professor, University of Quebec in Montreal. She specializes in Chinese history and Sino-Russian relations, among other, many other topics. And Ms. Sun Yuan is the Senior Fellow and Co-Director of the East Asia Program and Director of the China Program at Stimson Center in Washington, D.C. And Last but certainly not least, our dear friend, Professor Gordon Holden, Director Emeritus at the China Institute and Professor of Political Science at the University of Alberta. You could find our speaker's bio on our website. Without further ado, I would like to first invite Professor Alexeva to share her opening thoughts. Olga, the virtual floor is yours. Thank you very much, Tia, for this um, introduction. Good morning, everyone. Uh, so. During his last visit to Beijing, well, just a week before the invasion of Ukraine, Vladimir Putin said, well, the bonds between China and Russia have no limits. So what does this mean in practice? And how close China and Russia really are? I will most, mostly uh, focus on Russian perspective on the issue and try not to step on uh, my colleagues' uh, perspective that much. So, well, Vladimir is put in visit to China last February uh, gave me a strong sense of déjà vu. It reminds me of his visit to China in 2015 uh, when he signed, uh, among other things, uh, the formal contract um, on the construction of the pipeline, the, the power of Siberia. A very unfavorable deal for Russia, by the way. And just like in 2015, uh, in February, his visit happened during the um, public display of China's ambitions and power. And in 2015, uh, it was uh, a huge military parade in honor of China victory over Japan in World War II. And in February, well, as you know, it was the opening ceremony of the Winter Olympics. Uh, the international context was also very similar. Russia was facing increased isolation, economic difficulties following um, its aggressive policy towards Ukraine. But one thing was different though. In 2015, um, Russia's political and uh, economic elites had this naive idea that uh, China would help them to evade Western sanctions, that Chinese banks would provide unlimited loans, uh, that China would pay a good price for Russian gas and oil, that Chinese companies uh, would rush to Russian market. Well, none of these hopes materialized, at least not as Russians hoped they would. Uh, it is true, 
uh, since 2014, Russia and China signed a lot of agreements. Uh, Russia has joined the Belt and Road Initiative, uh, agreed to cooperate with China and Central Asia against, well, better judgment of uh, uh, Russian experts. Uh, Russia opened its Arctic projects to the Chinese companies, and it all seems very impressive. And well, to a certain extent, it is, especially if you read the official media. But, well, in reality, most of the announced uh, major infrastructure projects in the Arctic, Siberia, or in the Russian Far East, remain on paper only. Let me just give you one example. Um, in 2015, Russia and China have agreed to uh, launch their first jointly developed high-speed rail train uh, connecting Moscow to uh, Kazan, it's, uh, the, the capital of Tatarstan. So this project quickly became a symbol of this news in the Russian strategic partnership, the primal example of Russia's pivot to the East uh, in reaction to Western sanctions. At every meeting between Xi Jinping and Putin, it was mentioned. Well, we are in 2022, so seven years uh, have passed and the project still remains on paper only. Chinese companies, Chinese banks are very, as you know, very risk averse. And in 2014, Russia has become a very high risk market. So Russians who thought that Chinese would massively invest in their ventures quickly disappointed. And when Chinese did agree to invest, they imposed conditions that were difficult for Russians to accept. Uh, in case of the energy projects, for example, Moscow had to uh, bow to Chinese demands to lower the price of gas and oil. China's loans for the Arctic projects required Russia to use Chinese built LNG core process models and so on. And in February, uh, while well, hopes that China would help Russia to face while well, the increasing isolation were also expressed by experts by the putting surrounding delegation, but in a more, I would say, realistic way. Yes, China is interested in Russian gas, oil, and other natural resources. China will continue to buy them, but on its own conditions, conditions that won't be favorable to Russia. And Moscow seemed to have accepted the state of affairs, and many Russian China's watchers wondered then in February at least, so what kind of economic or maybe even geopolitical concessions Putin has made in order to be able to proclaim this so-called no limits friendship. Well, in 2014, this idea that China is an alternative for the West has become a real, I would say, mantra in the Kremlin. It was actively promoted by all the Russian official media. Uh, we all uh, have followed the unwrapping of the media story of Vladimir Putin and Xi Jinping bromance, uh, complete with gift sharing, medals awarding, uh, vodka drinking, and so on. And all this propaganda will help to anchor this idea into Russian people's minds. So unsurprisingly, in 2021, over 70% of Russians named China as their country closest friend, economic partner. So when Russia invaded Ukraine, and Western companies started leaving Russia, the first reaction of many ordinary people was, well, it's not that bad. Chinese companies will just, you know, replace the Western ones. There will be an adjustment, sure, but China certainly is capable of producing well enough computers, phones, shoes, airplanes, cars, and well, other essentials. And at first, China's refusal to condemn the invasion or even call it one, China's use of, you know, Russian rhetoric and its official statements entertained this illusion. The illusion that China will be Russia's lifeline. I saw some Russian politicians even suggest to nationalize factories owned by Western companies like Volkswagen, for example, and transfer them to the Chinese so they could produce Chinese cars and other consumer goods there. But well, as the war dragged on, signs of China's reluctance to assist Russia have emerged. Well, first, several major Chinese companies left Russian market following their Western counterparts. Companies like uh, Lenovo, TikTok, Didi, and TikTok actually named the increased censorship 
as the main reason for living. The irony of it is just priceless. Uh, Russian media announced a couple of days ago that China formally refused to supply Russia with airplane uh, parts, which, uh, as you know, are desperately needed because Russia has only foreign airplanes and all of those, almost all, all of those planes are not well owned by Russia. As for the Arctic projects, they are, as far as I know, uh, on standby now. So, but, well, these are the big companies. What about the small ones? Well, most of them are still present and declare their willingness to um, continue operating in Russia, but they have significantly raised their prices. Uh, we can understand why. Now that Russian consumer has no other choice, why not use this business opportunity? As for the Chinese material suppliers, um, they ask to be paid in dollars, and Russian small companies' reserves are frozen. The banks they use are under sanctions, so they can't order them from China anymore. Well, despite all the hopes so far, China refused to throw Moscow a lifeline. And this gave rise to the old geopolitical fears of China's intention to take over the Russian Far East and Siberia. So the narrative within Russia seems to change, and at least uh, we can see it on the social media platforms that are still available. So the narrative is different now, a little bit. You can find on the social media platforms a lot of kinds of China phobic scenarios. Statements like next Russian president will be Chinese or uh, when Russian stock market opens again, because well now it remains uh, frozen. So when it opens, the Chinese would buy all the shares in Russian companies for a fraction of the price and thus obtain well, a complete control of a Russian economy. And this reaction actually, well, strike a real contrast with previous views because until recently, China was portrayed in only one way, as an ally who shares the same values and who shares the same aspirations. And this, you know, switch, this change reminds me actually of the 1950s Sino-Russian friendship when China became an arch enemy uh, in the Soviet public discourse almost overnight. So my personal feeling is that Putin did tell Xi Jinping about his plans, but probably did not share the extent of them. Xi Jinping probably promised neutrality or maybe even a tacit support, but without you know, making any concrete promises about how and when and what. I think China will continue to express its neutrality, but won't help in any meaningful way until the end of the war. Why not? Well, let's imagine China did do decide to throw Russia a lifeline to win the war in Ukraine. Doing so, well, would damage Chinese relations with Europe. It would invite severe repercussions from Washington, and these are the obvious consequences. But also, China would be labeled as, well, imperial power. And it could drive hesitant neutral countries into the arms of the West, especially in the developing world. It's actually a pretty good argument for the US to use in order to build a coalition or to mobilize its allies against China. So will China assist Russia after the war? I say it depends on how this war ends and when. China is likely to find ways to help Moscow alleviate some effect of the sanctions without really blatantly violating them, like China has done with Iran and North Korea. But my question is always the same. What would be the cost, the price of this assistance? And I think my 10 minutes are up and I pass the, 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 the word for, for another for you. Thank you. Right, thank you, uh, Olga, for that um, um, overview of the China-Russia relationship or the, this complex relationship over the um, last uh, couple of years and, and also the uh, insight um, on um, Russians' public opinion, public perspectives um, on, um, on China that has been shifting and, and evolving. That is uh, uh, truly fascinating uh, as uh, many of us in, in, uh, situated or reside in the West, we can't seem to uh, see that side of the story. Now I would like to um, invite uh, Yun, to speak about um, the Chinese perspective on this. Um, Thank you. 
crisis. Thank you, Wang. Yeah, thank you, uh, Wang Jia, for the invitation to be here. Um, I'll cut to the chase. I'll focus on how China sees Russia and sees the alignment with Russia. Because uh, I think for, for, for Westerners and for foreigners who are not in China, uh, the nature of this relationship is just difficult to define. And people disagree. So is, it, is this relationship as strong and sturdy as an alliance? Or is actually as flimsy as what a lot of people call a marriage of convenience? Um, my argument is that the truth is that this relationship, China Russia relations, is neither and both. And it's a paradox. And the paradox is a result of both alignment and misalignment in different areas of their national interest. So there are certain factors innate to the China Russia relations that drive them apart. But currently, the two are glued together by their shared view that the United States poses a bigger threat to their core national interest. So an accurate assessment of this, uh, of this relationship is therefore quite important in terms of the policy response. Um, I find that the, so for example, for the close alignment between China and Russia, first and foremost is to come to the United States and driven by their perceived shared ho hostility by the United States. So meanwhile, the leadership preference, especially Xi Jinping's personal affinity towards Russia and Putin also play a key role in driving the alignment with Russia. And I, some would argue that this alignment has been beyond China's national interest. However, these factors do not negate the fact that China and Russia differ fundamentally in their visions and approaches to the international system. Their alignment is based solely on their shared anti-US agenda and leadership preference. And as such, the Chinese assessment of the long-term prospect of the sino russia relations is not as glorified as it seems. So China and Russia are currently being pushed together by two factors. The first one is the United States. The second one is the leadership level nostalgia for the uh, Sino-Soviet partnership. So most salient characteristics of the Sino-Russia alignment is their shared threat perception of the United States. And the alignment between China and Russia is significant for alleviating strategic pressure on both China and Russia, at least psychologically. At the minimum, for China, it provides a reassurance that China is not conquering the United States and its, hege and its hegemony alone. As long as the US pursues a dual containment of both China and Russia, the alignment will have motivation and justification. Given the overarching theme in the Chinese national security strategy that defines the US as China's primary threat, any disagreements with Russia are seen as secondary and the Russia diplomatic and military capabilities and uh, are seen as a valuable asset for China. Although US factor is a primary driver, there's also a secondary, but also more obscure driver on the Chinese side, which is Xi Jinping's Russia complex. Xi Jinping's education background was profoundly shaped by Russian culture, which he acknowledged dur during his visit to Russia in 2014 and then in 2015. The nostalgia and the preference for Russian history and the culture is a broad phenomenon observed among people who grew up in China in the 1950s and 60s. She, as a princeling from that generation, is among the most saturated by Soviet influence. Furthermore, according to uh, my observation, Xi's Russia complex also includes a strong admiration of Putin as a strongman leader and a deep desire to be Putin's peer. This is easy to understand. Xi is powerful because China is powerful, but Putin is powerful when Russia is weak. So in the Chinese popular culture, Putin is nicknamed the great emperor who is intelligent, decisive, manipulative, and powerful. And this is a status that she deeply desires. So regardless of these two drivers, the most important determinant of China-Russia relations is how China views Russia as a power, its strengths, its weaknesses, and how they affect China. That is where an analysis of China's relationship with Russia must begin with. So in China, Russia is regarded as one of the only three world powers with global influence, along with the United States and China. This assessment is not based on a singular factor such as economy or military asset, but rather a judgment about Russia's comprehensive national power. When China looks at Russia, it sees a nation torn between great power ambitions and the weak power capabilities. That tension in the Chinese view is a fundamental origin of the Russian insecurity 
anxiety, and strategic choices today. However, judged by most domestic indicators, Russia is not a great power. Its economy is uh, has been stagnated, stagnant with an average annual growth rate of 1% since 2009. And remember, in 2020, due to COVID, the Russian economy shrank by 3.1%. Its GDP ranks 11th in the world, which is 7% of that of the US and 10% of the Chinese economy. And its research and development spending is about 10% of the Chinese and American spending, respectively. In 2020, uh, last but not least, Russia's military spending was 61 billion US dollars, which was about a quarter of the Chinese defense spending and 8% of the American defense spending. So if the spending is the most convincing indicator of a country's strength and future trajectory, Russia does not inspire confidence. Traditionally, China has high regards for Russia as a military power, but this respect is also diminishing. China's military spending, like I mentioned, is four times that of Russia. So in the Chinese discourse, if Russia does not have the budget for military research and development and system upgrades, it will increasingly lag behind and become a quote, quote, gas station disguised as a nuclear power. But there is one aspect of Russia's national power that elicits the highest respect from Chinese strategists. And that is Russia's strategic vision, its strong will and ability to utilize combine and integrate military power, diplomatic manipulation, and hybrid warfare to advance such a vision. Russia pursues a hybrid warfare, combine, combining information, cyber, and psychological warfare to create a chaos that benefits Russia, helping Russia to achieve geopolitical goals that otherwise would be beyond Russia's means. So Russia can adapt to use this informational warfare, for example, in the US elections, and in refugee crisis. So the ability to combine this type, of, uh, this type of hybrid warfare to achieve geopolitical goals is the one trait that China admires, but does not really possess. Meanwhile, we also have to look, at, look beyond their short-term postures and look at their grand strategic goals between China and Russia in order to assess their alignment and the sustainability of this alignment. So simply put, do China and Russia share the same end game, the same vision, and the same approach to the international system? So if we bear this question in mind, the prospect for long-term Sino-Russia cooperation are ultimately limited. First, China and Russia have different visions for international order. As Xi Jinping has indicated, China has been a beneficiary of the international system since the end of the Cold War. She therefore seeks to reform and modify that system, but does not seek to replace it. In comparison, Putin caused the dissolution of the Soviet Union, the biggest tragedy of the 20th century, and sees Russia as a victim of the same international system that China has benefited from. As such, China's strategy has largely been one of peaceful rise, beating for global supremacy by surpassing the US without a war or major disruption. This is also the essence of the new model of major power relations proposed by Xi as a peaceful mechanism to manage the power transition and avoid the Thucydides trap. In comparison, Russia's comparative advantage is military and diplomatic power and hybrid warfare approach, lacking its strategy of chaos to maximize Russian leverage and bargaining power. In other words, Russia benefits from instability while China prefers stability. They both seek to revise the international order, but differ in the magnitude and the process by which they want to change it. The misalignment between China and Russia is also reflected in their low level of bilateral trade, quantitatively and qualitatively. China-Russia trade increased by a pretty impressive 38, 39% last year to a 147 billion US dollars. However, the majority of this increase came from the inflation of energy price. The volume of the trade only grew by less than 6%. And also to put this in perspective, China-Russia trade is smaller than China's trade with Vietnam, which was 166 billion in 2021. Furthermore, the trade is also unbalanced as natural resources makes up more than 70% of Russia's total export to China. Imbalance itself does not suggest misalignment but Russia's primary role as a raw material supplier does. 
China's economic transformation is based on high technologies, such as AI and new energy resources. In, in high tech, China's research and development spending is 10 times that of Russia. On new energy, China's commitment to reduce carbon emission will eventually lead to a decline of energy imports from Russia. In other words, Russia will play a minor role in this economic transformation. When we look at the joint statement between Xi and Putin from February 4th, it does indicate that China uh, sino russia alignment is stronger than ever. But as we have seen in the uh, Ukraine crisis, it also illustrates a difficult reality of the Chinese acquiescence to Russian behavior, which is in response to increasing strategic competition with the United States, China is turning to Russia for support, despite the misalignment between Beijing and Moscow's national interest, as well as Russia's history as a destructive and exploitative neighbor. There's no better example of marriage of convenience than this, and China will pay for this dearly in the long run. It's hard to predict the longevity and the, and the stability of the current Sino-Russia alignment. It begins and ends with China's anti-US agenda and is strengthened by Xi Jinping's personal preferences. There's a famous Chinese saying among the Russia hands, Russia hands in China that China and Russia can only share miseries, but not happiness. Without shared vision, goals, and approaches, China and Russia will align against a common enemy. Yet it will split in a destructive way when the delicate equilibrium is disrupted by any structural change in the international system. Thank you for the opportunity. I will stop there and look forward to Gordon's remarks. Thank you. Thank you, Yun, um, uh, for that uh, detailed <clears throat> excellent explanation and insightful assessment of the alignment and misalignment of um, uh, China and Russia's uh, interest and, and from a Chinese perspective. That was truly fascinating. And uh, now let's um, turn to Gordon for your opening thoughts. Well, thank you very much. And I've listened with great interest to the uh, comments by Olga and, and Yun. And it's never easy to follow those two. Um, but I'm going to look, turn a little bit, my focus will be on um, how the Ukraine war may have affected or has affected China's relations with other countries and some of the broad uh, political and economic military affairs that we're seeing some of these changes since the fighting broke out. As you noted, these are still early days. I mean, even the German blitzkrieg in Poland took um, uh, much longer time, uh, five to six weeks before that was included. Uh, we're only three plus weeks into this fighting, um, it's my uh, mistake to make definitive conclusions on a war that still has, I fear, some time to run. But we do see a few broad conclusions already. One, I think at least in the West, but I suspect in China as well, we're seeing uh, increase in the importance given to security issues, at least in the short term, um, overcoming economic preoccupations. Um, but what about the effects on the relationship with the with the United States, for example, uh, we are going to need further clarity um, over time of Chinese intentions vis-a-vis -vis Russia. Um, we know from the conversations that have been taking place between Secretary Blinken um, and and Russian counterparts between Biden and Xi uh, that there is deep U.S. concern that Russia will provide, if not weapons. Uh, extraordinary economic support. I think Yun has cast a little bit of cold water on, on that prospect, but Chinese intentions are not, yet, are not yet particularly clear. I think there are some conclusions that we will see. The already underway Chinese efforts to grow its domestic capacity in high-tech sectors uh, may intensify. Um, COVID-caused supply chain woes and inflationary pressures have been accelerated by the Ukraine war. This is a, a global phenomenon that we've seen emerge in just a few short weeks. As Olga noted, Russia cannot obtain spare parts for its fleet of aircraft manuf manufactured in the West. This will be noted by China, which may now wish to accelerate its own efforts for greater self-sufficiency as it endeavors to at least partially sanction-proof its economy. That's a very tall order for China, given its status as the world's largest trading nation. 
um, financial independence in particular for China outside of Western and US dominated financial structures will be particularly difficult. This could be a generational task, but it will have, in my view, the remarkable coherence so far at least of Western countries in sanctioning China, sanctioning Russia rather, will be watched very carefully by China in terms of its own uh, vulnerabilities. And broadly speaking, I think we will see Chinese efforts to reduce the dependence on foreign and US financial tools. The United States has, at least in the narrowest term, focused a short-term cohesion between Democrats and Republicans on Russia, while the broad bipartisan consensus that China poses the greater risk to US's global standing in the longer term, that remains intact. Now, I would put an asterisk there saying, for some in the Trump camp, um, there is unease at uh, uh, sanctioning Putin and Russia broadly. That squabble within the Republican Party is still playing out, but there is a greater uh, cohesion between the two parties than had been the case three weeks ago. Um, I think that the rewardings again from Biden and Blinken have also, uh, not to arm and not to undermine sanctions, have also uh, underlined for the US that the only state that attains substantive leverage with Russia is China. Now to NATO. Um, NATO, which in my view, in the wake of the dissolution of the Soviet Union, appeared to have lost its raison d'etre to some extent, has been revitalized, not just as a concrete expression of transatlantic solidarity, but also as a potential, hopefully not needed, war fighting alliance. China, for its part, which has been for decades assiduously courting Europe and making efforts to pry apart Europe and the United States, uh, has seen this cohesion, I suspect, uh, with, if not alarm, at least disquiet. The Belt and Road Initiative, at least the land bridge portion of it, uh, lies in tatters, as all of the land routes to Central and Western Europe from China must pass through Russia and then through either Ukraine or Belarus. At least in the short to medium term, uh, this is a broken tool. Of course, there are sea alternatives. There is one route that's very awkward. It crosses the Caspian Sea and goes through Turkey and the Bosporus, uh, but that's, that's an expensive and longer uh, routing. For Canada, I won't focus on Canada. Our relations with China already are an exceptionally low ebb, and it's hard to envisage even pre the Ukraine war and early recovery. But any effort by China to subvert sanctions on Russia or to provide substantive financial or military assistance will be yet a further burden on the already strained relationship. Again, these are early days, and we haven't really seen the color of the Chinese assistance that will be provided to Russia, how standard it'll be, how far it will go. If we look at East Asia, American partners or allies, um, Japan, ROK, Taiwan, quickly fell into line on sanctions. When I look at South and Southeast Asia, it's a different matter. Um, Southeast Asia has been relatively quiescent in its reaction to the Ukraine. Uh, I don't see any perturbation in this relationship with China at all. South Asia, in fact, in the, Russia, in the Indian case, they are increasing purchases of Russian oil, although Russia is still a minor provider of, of energy to India. And there are real barriers to how large that expansion can be, given the physical limitations and the fact that it takes time, a lot of time actually, to realign energy flows. As well, uh, there's no sign that India will uh, reduce its uh, partial reliance on Russian military assistance. But with a war that's not yet concluded and with heavy Russian losses in the, um, uh, in the conflict, uh, there may well yet be effect on that as well. I'm going to touch on Taiwan, which wasn't formally a part of this talk, uh, but it's always in the background and there's been no short, shortage of media speculation as to how the Ukraine war might affect or might not affect Beijing's own calculations vis-a-vis -vis Taiwan. It is, I'll let myself off to some extent, too early to gauge with any precision um, whether Beijing's efforts to reunify Taiwan with the mainland will be affected in, in a substantive way. Perhaps if the Russian campaign had gone smoothly with swift advances, the capture of the Ukrainian leadership and the quick installation of a pro-Moscow uh, go government in Kiev, a la Czechoslovakia in 1968 or Crimea in, in 2014, 
Xi Jinping might have been emboldened to accelerate planning for invasion of Taiwan. But an opposed amphibious landing has always been, and always will be in my view, one of the more hazardous and uncertain affairs. Resupply of Taiwan from the outside, especially from the United States, would be more difficult than is the case of Ukraine's land borders with NATO countries. So that you know, Taiwan is a, a special case. It, the parallels with Ukraine are, are perhaps flawed. But as we've seen, and as Putin has realized, the reality is that wars are easier to start than to finish. And this has been driven home by just the three weeks of fighting. It's possible that even Xi Jinping has been more willing to lean forward in foreign affairs than previous Chinese presidents may have been reminded or has been reminded of the hazards of war in the face of stubborn Ukrainian resistance and the scale and scope of Western sanctions and assistance uh, to Kyiv. Historically, colonies or allies of imperial powers have been most often snatched by rival states during times of crisis or sustained weakness in the metropole or at home. A cautious China, and I do believe that China is fundamentally conservative in its foreign policy and military affairs, might well prefer to wait for a period of domestic chaos or paralysis in the United States before moving on Taiwan, although this does have the disadvantage of putting off any plans of action for the immediate future. But 2024 is not far away. Taiwan, beyond ambiguous US defense commitments, lacks Ukraine's near neighbor NATO alliance and relatively close cultural bonds with Europe, although Japan is a partial parallel. But there's another lesson for the Ukraine war, possession, of a sizable nuclear force prevents direct military involvement of NATO in the Ukraine, be it a no-fly zone or the direct provision of NATO troops due to the very real risks of escalation and even a nuclear war. Whether China would make similar threats uh, would, in the face of US efforts uh, to directly involve its own naval, air and land forces in the defense of Taiwan is uncertain. But I do believe that the de clear deterrence effect of Russia's huge nuclear weapons stockpile may push China towards a, a, an increase, substantive increase in its own comparatively modest nuclear capacity. I think my time is up and I will stop there and pass back the, uh, the parole to, to Ja. Thank you. Right, thank you. Um, Gordon, for for that um, um, re for your remarks and uh, and to um, highlight some of the Western responses and also the implications of this war for China. Um, as we um, continue to watch uh, this um, situation unfold, uh, of course, uh, this morning I think um, President Biden and President Xi had uh, their um, virtual meeting. Um, and uh, it, it just just happened um, um, just this morning. So um, uh, of course, information search just coming out in terms of uh, the readout, and uh, they're they're already um, uh, readout from uh, very brief ones from from the Chinese media. Uh, Gordon, I, I would uh, like to ask if um, you have any comments about this Xi Biden call. Um, sure, I might well. Are you in reminded me today of the um, um, anodyne Chinese response. So I had a quick look at that and, and Yun was quite right. Uh, it is pious calls for world peace and cooperation and revealed, in my opinion, absolutely nothing of what I suspect was the very heated debate uh, with, between those two leaders. It's a classic case of saying absolutely nothing in, in, a, in a few words. We still haven't seen, at least I haven't seen the US readout, but I would note that this, this meeting went very long, over two hours. I'm not sure if they're using consecutive or simultaneous translation, but the minimum, that's one full hour of, of debate, possibly two. I'm hoping for a, a US, a country that has a great number of secrets, but manages to leak a lot of them. I suspect we will see some color, not just from official spokespeople, from others who gradually, as the circle widens of those who are privy to that conversation. Uh, but I think we can know at least from Blinken's and Biden's public statements, some of the key messages will be, don't dare provide military assistance uh, to Russia. Uh, don't be associated with a, a criminal regime in their, in their views. Uh, do not provide a means by which Russia can escape sanctions, um, um, Western sanctions. And uh, uh, that I think will be the core messaging vis-a-vis -vis the Ukraine. 
I would love to see to have been a fly on the wall at conversation. I'll just stop there. I think we'll know a lot more within another 24 to 48 hours. Thank you. Uh, would you like to jump in and, and uh, um, provide your assessment of this call? Uh, sure. Yeah, like Gordon said, we haven't seen the American readout just yet, but based on the Chinese readout, what I see is that China practically proposed to the United States, let's have a U.S.-China G2 to co-manage Russia. Because we're the largest two economies in the world, we're the member of, members of the P5, and now peace and tranquility of the international order has been uh, has been threatened. So let's work together on that. So I, I, my, my main takeaway is I don't think Moscow is going to enjoy that message very much, uh, but I think it does reflect the China's priority coming to uh, coming to its, its own national security, which is to um, hopefully make deals with the Americans. Because uh, the mentality goes that if US wants to solicit Chinese consensus or Chinese support of its agenda on, on Russia, then I'm sure the Chinese following question is, so what do we get? Are you going to um, provide us with quote, quote, positive incentives or rewards on the issue of, uh, of Taiwan? And I think one, um, one indicator of that mentality is uh, if you read the Chinese ambassador to US Qinggang's open letter on Washington Post a few days ago, he basically spent the first half talking about the Ukraine situation and the second half on Taiwan. And it makes you wonder that, well, what is, the, what is the correlation or what is the, uh, the, the causality here? So um, I think Gordon is right that I think the message from the US side to China is very clear. Um, but I think the, the, devil is, the devil is always with the details, right? Do not associate with Russia. What, does con what constitute associate? And do not help Russia evade sanctions. Well, that's, uh, that's the trade deals reached before the Russian invasion of Ukraine constitute a uh, violation or evasion of, of sanctions. So I think the Davos is uh, always in the details. Thank you. Well, thank you, Yun. Um, Olga, would you like to uh, comment on that as well? Just, just a quick fan fact. It was not reported on Russian news that Biden and Xi Jinping spoke for two hours. So I think it shows uh, <laughs> the, the, the reaction of Moscow and uh, the few uh, mentions on media platforms I found, it was uh, treated as an opportunity. Xi Jinping and Biden spoke to just assess the position of each other at, and it's nothing more than that. So I leave you to this. <laughs> well, thank you. Um, so there have been a lot of talk about um, you know, China uh, having rather good relationship, of course, with, with Russia and Ukraine. There are very few countries, especially among the great powers uh, uh, on the global stage, actually have that kind of a relationship. And European Union um, and even some in the US are pushing to have China play a bigger role in, the, in finding a peaceful resolution uh, to end this war. But China so far has been somewhat reluctant um, would you like to comment on, you know, why is that? Would, wouldn't China, in a way, be favoring to uh, be that, uh, to serve as that mediator and to perhaps boost its international standing if, if it comes to a positive uh, result? Or China has its um, uh, reluctance uh, in playing that role because it worries that it may not um, come to a quick and easy um, solution and, and, and may entangle China in that um, whole uh, nightmare. So um, I, I don't know if uh, Olga would like to <laughs> give it a try. Well, you know, me personally, I don't really believe in this, you know, um, bromance between Putin and Xi Jinping. Uh, it's a lot of it for show. I don't think it's, you know, just because they seems to have a very good relationship between them on personal level, it's going to have a great implication on China's strategy or Russia's strategy or all this, how this friendship is going to um, find its way in some strategic um, way of thinking. Um, I, I think I, 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 I sh well, I gave a lot of examples how well, friendship seems very good, but then on the economic side, 
uh, the partnership is not that great. Well, we sp spoke about the Arctic and how China participate in all the projects in Russia's in, in Russia's Arctic, but and always we portray it as a Sino-Russian partnership, but in, the truth is all these great major projects are international projects. There is a uh, French total there, there is Japanese banks, uh, Korean tankers, a lot of companies and interests are there. So it's not only um, a sign of Sino-Russian great partnership. And I think because Russian media and Chinese media really stress this out and really underscore it all the time, we have this tendency to really put it to give it a lot of attention while in the reality uh, what will be the real strategy and how china will really react and russia will depend on other factors uh, i think on the chinese position is better equipped to <laughs> to comment than me so i just and unfortunately i have some not background noise I'm, I'm i'm sorry if you can hear it so just pass the words to my colleague Great. Oh, thank you, Olga. Over to Yun, if you'd like to uh, provide some perspective, perhaps from the from the Chinese end on how the, the government and leadership assessing its position and its involvement in uh, helping to uh, resolve this major conflict. Uh, I think when the when the when the invasion first happened, the, the Chinese were caught by surprise. I don't think that Putin told, I agree with Olga, I don't think Putin told Xi exactly what he, he had in mind because by February 4th, he may not know what he was going to do at that point. So, um, so I, China was caught off guard by a full scale invasion of Ukraine. They were probably anticipating that, yeah, well, Russia probably will do what they did in, in Crimea in 2014, carve out Denbas, probably support its independence through a referendum but they weren't expecting a full-scale invasion. So I think the first two weeks after the invasion, really we saw a lot of the Chinese defensiveness, a lot of the awkwardness, and also a sense of uncertainty that, well, we, we want this war to end as quickly as possible, so we no longer have to face international criticism or questions on what happened to your principle of sovereignty and territorial integrity. But I think after the initial two weeks, the Chinese are becoming more cognizant, conscious, and confident about their, about their position. There are discrepancies in their position. There's no doubt that on one hand, that China refuses to oppose or abandon Russia. But on the other hand, that China still supports Ukraine in terms of its sovereignty and territorial integrity. It almost has become a pattern if you look at all the Chinese official statement about this war. Russia, well, they didn't say Russia, legitimate security concerns of countries and sovereignty and territorial integrity are often, well, almost without exception, mentioned in the same sentence. It reflects that China is trying to balance among different competing or sometimes conflicting agendas and, and, and positions. And is, is, is it awkward? Yeah, is it, it is awkward. Is it difficult to justify? No, I don't think it's, it's really that difficult for the Chinese to justify. Um, so inconsistency in terms of the, um, the, the positions struggling among different layers of national interest is not, is not that uncommon. Um, and last but not least, I think the Chinese are gradually identifying this as an opportunity because not picking a position by itself is a position. When you do not pick a side, all sides will have to come to you for support and for cooperation. And that's agency and that is power. I think that's also what the Biden-Xi phone call reflected, at least from the Chinese perspective, that now US needs Chinese cooperation and consensus on the war of Ukraine and the Chinese will be eager to see what the U.S. is willing to put on the table. So that, unfortunately, I think is, uh, is, is where we are today, that China is gradually seeing this more as an opportunity rather than a crisis. Thank you. Thank you, Yun. Uh, Gordon, would you like to comment as well? Just add a few words. Uh, I think uh, Olga and Yun have, have made some very good points. Again, I'd emphasize this war is in early stages. And there are some short-term advantages, clearly, to China, a weakened Russia, even more dependent um, upon China, a US that is greatly distracted um, by events in Europe, delaying perhaps, or at least making more difficult, um, moving uh, more military forces into the Western reaches of the Pacific Ocean. But um, if this war, we're not finished yet, and even Sun Tzu used to say that if you corner a tiger, you may want to let that tiger away to slip away. 
Um, others on this, particularly, I think, Olga know Putin far better than I do. But we're not out of the risks category of a broader war. And China, with its, in my view, generally conservative approach, and with its dependence on a, on a strong economic, a strong global economy, um, may still have nervousness about the fact that this war is not done. We don't know how long it's going to last, and we don't know what the corollary effects and the possibility of a cornered Putin striking out in some fashion. If China somehow, at some point, were able to help broker an agreement which met some, some of Putin's demands and, and brought peace to the Ukraine, this would be a huge feather in China's cap and would relieve some of that uh, latent risk of a broader war. I'm not saying this is imminent, just that there are circumstances where this might, this might be done. Well, thank you, um, panelists, for um, all your comments here. Um, I've got a question from the audience member. Um, is there a space for middle powers uh, like Canada, Japan, and, and Germany to perhaps facilitate reform in the UN Security Council to help um, create a more stable geopolitical environment into the future? Would... Um, um, any panelists like to uh, take a stab at that? Um, um, what Canada role can Canada roles be uh, enhanced, or some other middle powers role be enhanced? And this multilateral organization, um, uh, this type of finding resolution through multilateral collaboration and and, and uh, uh, cooperation be enhanced. I think that's or, important. Well, it's a good question. Um, when the, it's an East Indian saying, I think when the tigers fight, it's the grass gets hurt. And I'm not sure that when the great powers are maneuvering, um, Russia is some ways a great power, somewhat a spent power. Um, but uh, as, um, you, as Yuan made a good point about Chinese desire for perhaps for a G2 world, I'm not sure that our profile is that greatly enhanced. We have had a high profile uh, in the Ukraine war partly because of the Ukrainian population in Canada. Uh, I think that's been a major factor. And certainly the United States wants and needs NATO solidarity and it's there as it's not been for, for many decades. Um, I think given our almost non-existent relationship with Russia now where our whole Canadian cabinet is sanctioned by Moscow and where our relationship with China is at a very low ebb, has been for several years, and I don't see any quick signs of, for improvement I think we're not in a good position to play a particularly strong role. We're more role more likely to be simply to be a loyal member of NATO, providing the amount of assistance we can, although with a very modest military capacity. Right. Um, um, well, and of course we are seeing uh, these this Russian war, uh, the Russian uh, invasion of the Ukraine from a Western perspective, but um, a lot of Asian countries, uh, India, for example, also abstained from um, condemning Russia on the UN Security Council. And some other nation countries um, are also keeping a bit of a distance um, from um, making a strong um, stance um, on, on the war. Do we see a bit of a divide um, uh, when it comes to responses to the Ukraine um, war. Um, if we look at the Western allies, the, the Western nations, there seems to be a strong um, unity created um, and, and quickly materialized uh, when it comes to uh, sanction and, and jointly uh, strongly condemning uh, Russians invasion. But, but in other parts of the world, uh, especially in the neighborhood, like in Asia, um, country seems to be more cautious um, or taking um, more of a, certain countries are taking more of a neutral stand. Um, do you see this um, dynamic uh, is shaping up and it may potentially have future implications? Gordon, would you like to? Uh, sure, I mean, first? that's such a complex question and uh, it's, Again, these early days, I think we there is a bifurcation already um, pretty clearly between uh, NATO countries and the US's closest allies in Asia and the rest of the world. Uh, we can assume that, I think 
Canadians, I'm speaking as a Canadian, assume that the whole of the world is thinking about nothing but Ukraine right now, whereas when I look at uh, Southeast Asia uh, or much of the less developed world, um, there's in some cases some sympathy for Russia, um, a lot of sympathy for Ukraine perhaps, but the governments are not in the same spaces that uh, NATO or the West are at by any means. And I don't see that shift from economic preoccupations to a preoccupation about uh, about Eastern Europe, albeit a relatively large country there. Um, if things deteriorate further and we see the risk of a broader war, or if we see um, knock-on effects, economic knock-on effects, which are possible uh, from supply chain disruptions, um, fueling of inflation, I think this will have bigger waves. But those waves of reaction that are moving out from the Ukraine, I find that those waves are greatly diminished uh, outside of Europe, uh, North America, and the and uh, East Asian allies of the United States. Would um, you like to comment as well? Well, that's a great question. If you look at the uh, UN General Assembly voting on uh, early, I believe it was March 2nd, on the uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine, we got 141 countries voting to condemn Russia. We got about 35, I believe, um, that abstained. And then we have only a very small number of countries that, um, that I think four or five, um, five that, um, that voted against the, um, against the resolution. So I think that by itself is a pretty clear manifestation of where countries stand on this, on this issue. Coming to the concrete actions to, uh, to influence Russian behavior or to punish Russian behavior, that's a different question because that actually requires country to take a toll and pay the cost of such an action. And coming to Europe, it means that, well, can Europe still import energy resources from, from Russia? And here in North America, at least in the United States, we're seeing the, uh, the gas price going now around somewhere around $5 per gallon. So there is going to be a cost to be paid for that punitive approach. And I think different countries have different answers because different countries have different considerations. And like, I think we, we mentioned, um, Gordon mentioned India. India still relies on Russia. India is the largest client of the uh, Russian weapon system in terms of the arms sales. So if we want to pursue a sanction-oriented punitive approach, it's inevitably going to affect our own interest and also the interest of our allies and partners. So I don't think there is a straight answer to your question, but I think each country will have to decide based on the calculation of their own national interest regardless of whether their moral principle is being observed. Thank you. Well, thank you for that very um, realistic, uh, realism uh, type of uh, kind of, uh, um, yeah, assessment. Uh, indeed, national interests uh, do matter and, and, and sometimes they do uh, pre prevail. And Olga, would you like to uh, uh, comment on this as well? Well, I'll just give an example. Uh, French President Macron tried to influence Putin uh, many times. It didn't happen. Uh, nothing changed. As for the um, Asian countries' reaction, uh, well, I think well, they all have a lot of relationship with Russia in different spheres. And as you said, they have to think about their own interests. I think a lot of countries are watching Chinese position of neutrality and are assuming the same position, kind of wait and see. And we will, once the war has ended, we evaluate then. But for now, it's safer to keep distance, not to be part of this conflict. And even Europeans, if you see even Fran, Fran, France and uh, France especially, they try, they condemned. But at the same time, total didn't, total didn't leave. Russian market, uh, Roi Merlin didn't leave Russian market and so on. And so it's very ambiguous and everyone trying is trying to save their own interests. Great, well, thank you, Olga. Um, there's a question actually addressed to you. The seven Arctic Council members uh, state made a joint statement earlier this month to temporarily pause the participation um, in all meetings uh, of the council. Um, uh, by uh, by Russia and uh, do you see, given I mean the war continued to rage on and um, and uh, given China's close relationship with Russia in the Arctic, um, do you think 
US, Canada, and the um, five Nordic countries would want to deepen economic cooperation and integrate China into regional decision-making forums um, if it choose to side with Russian, uh, Russia on the Ukraine crisis. So it's um, more of a Arctic question. I know you have done some research um, involving the Arctic issues. Thank you. So, well, Arctic Council, it's a consultative body that doesn't take any decision that can change anything in the Arctic. So it's purely, you know, to discuss and, uh, well, develop maybe some policy that might or might not be uh, put into the real application. Uh, so far, if you look to on China's strategy and China's presence in the Arctic, China's presence in the Arctic is in the Russian Arctic and nowhere else. So, yeah, maybe uh, it would, if China float with the uh, more like Western position on the Ukraine, maybe there will be new contracts and maybe there will be a repercussion or some new interest in the Arctic or the Canada or I, I can't imagine, but maybe Norway or Finland would finally accept all the proposition that Chinese companies made in uh, in regards to the develop, development of their Arctic regions. But Arctic is a very a highly strategic point and place. And uh, I, I really like the remark uh, of my colleague, Yuen, who said what, how, how we deal with this sanction, because all the Chinese interests in the Arctic are, have been taken prior to the introduc introduction of the sanctions. So whether these new sanctions gonna influence what already done other the will will these big uh, arctic projects will be affected by the war in ukraine i'm not so sure because there are too many foreign interests there there is total there is japan there is uh, german technology GNL technology american lng technology so uh, and here I agree with Gordon, we will just have to wait till the war ends. For now, it's just impossible to make any predictions. Thank you, um, Olga. And I think this, this question might be um, um, better addressed, uh, addressed by uh, Yun is uh, the question from an audience member, given the current military situation, are there any voices in China calling for potential um, annexation of Eastern Siberia to um, take uh, a Chinese claim in the Arctic, um, and uh, and also you know considering that option of um, um, uh, ex annexing Taiwan. So from a Chinese, uh, maybe more of a popular view per perspective, um, do you see the calling um, of of those uh, happening? I actually don't see it. Um, well, there might be some some relevance for, for Taiwan, um, but it's a, it's a different kind of re relevance. First, in terms of the, uh, the territorial claims that, yeah, well, when China looks at history, I think the lesson is, uh, well, no matter how much we resent the United States as our largest national security threat today, historically, Russia is the single one country that has taken most territory from China. And there's just end of statement. That's just true in the, in the, in the, Chinese, per, uh, in the Chinese perspective. And when China looks at what, what Russia did in Crimea, it inevitably reminds China of what Russia did in Mongolia back in 1920s. That basically used the same strategy to first promote Mongolia to declare independence and inked it with a referendum. So, um, and also fast forward into 1940s, Russia also tried to uh, repeat the same, same pattern in, uh, in Xinjiang. So the only East, Eastern Turkestan state that has existed in history that was established with Russian military intervention and Russian military support very briefly in the 1940s. Um, so I think when China looks at the Crimea and looks at Donbass, there's a lot of uh, reminders of, uh, of the same pattern that Russia has repeated historically to China and although the, the popular Chinese narrative is that Russia has annexed a total of 1.5 million square, square kilometers of Chinese territories, 
this does not include Mongolia and other territories that Russia has carved out and promoted to be independent uh, from, from China historically. And the actual number of the total ter territory, territorial loss um, of China because of Russia is somewhere, I think the Chinese count is uh, 4 million square kilometers. That's half of China today. So I think that really reveals the kind of historical agony when China looks at the, the history with Russia. Well, it does not always inspire confidence, um, but is China going to take over Siberia? I think that's, that's going to be very, very hard because um, the border has been settled in the, in the form of a treaty. So it does not provide China with any legal ground to still launch any territorial claims against the, uh, the territories that China sees Russia took from it historically. But on the other hand, uh, I think for China is it, well, again, this com comes back to the invasion of, of Ukraine. Um, the Chinese didn't believe that Russia would do it because China wouldn't do it. That in terms of the art of war, winning without fighting is the ultimate art of war, right? Fighting is the least desirable and territorial occupation is seen as the least desirable military strategy. So I think when China looks at Russia and, is, and even look at Siberia, there are ways that China can pursue its uh, economic interests in those region um, through the form of, for example, agricultural collaboration um, and the Chinese farmers basically farming land in, uh, in Siberia. So I think the, 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 the fact is that these territories have been lost to China and China is not gonna gain, is not gonna gain it back. But it doesn't mean that China cannot be there. But so there are other ways that uh, China can still um, still benefit from um, from from economic cooperation in, on those territories. Taiwan is a separate question. Um, there have been questions about well, is Xi Jinping going to use the opportunity to attack Taiwan so U.S. will be distracted among two war theaters? Well, I did not believe it because China has its own agenda and schedule coming to national national unification. It's not just about the military campaign, it's also about how to govern Taiwan after that military campaign. So I don't think Beijing's plan will be subject to any temporary or circumstantial changes like the Russian invasion of Ukraine. But are there takeaways for China uh, from the Russian invasion of Ukraine? I think there are a lot of takeaways and most of these takeaways are giving China pause coming to a military operation against Taiwan. First, well, Everyone, I guess, not everyone, but most people were anticipating Russia to have a, what they call swift and decisive military victory within days. Well, now we're at what day 22, 23, and it still has not happened. So the, um, the local pushbacks, the mass resistance, the impact of social media, as well as the, what they call the non-military deterrence from the Western sanctions against, uh, against um, Russia, as a result of the invasion. I think these are all sending signals to Beijing that while well, you need to pause, that the, the end result of a military invasion of Taiwan may not turn out to be the way that you think it would. So I think, again, uh, these are still evolving. Um, the lessons are being learned, are being analyzed, but um, I think there are significant implications for China's future plan on Taiwan. Thank you. Thank you, Yun. Um, maybe just uh, we're, we're coming to an end, to the end of our panel discussion uh, today, and uh, maybe just very quickly, um, if each panelist can jump in just for a couple minutes. Um, it, it, we're dealing with this Im immediate uh, security threat and, and crisis uh, in Ukraine, um, but in the long run, um, and there's already uh, signs um, the, 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 the talk about the Indo. Um, Pacific strategy um, in the US, in Canada, and uh, in the West. And um, this Ukrainian crisis seems to heighten the, um, uh, this, this uh, formation of uh, blocks, uh, the Western, the um, uh, democratic bloc, and the autocratic bloc. And do you see this potential conflicts, or at least tension, um, into the future? will perhaps dominate um, international relations in the, um, in the mid to, to even long term. Um, Gordon, would you like to uh, jump in on I'm that? I'm happy to just jump in for a moment. I do tend to agree with the Chinese that the US relationship is far more important than the Russian relationship. 
I think we are seeing at least temporarily uh, coalition, uh, cohesion amongst democratic states. How long that will last, I think will depend partly on how this war proceeds. But a couple of the knock-on effects I think will be enduring, it's further undermining uh, the supply chain system internationally. Um, states are, at least speaking of Europe and North America, beginning to refocus um, away from large economic preoccupations to put a greater weight on security. Uh, this has been something that's been largely neglected, at least since the end of the Cold War. I think we're now seeing states begin to say, well, let's look to security um, in a more prominent fashion and, and not simply a matter uh, of, of trade. I'll pass on. Olga, would you like to uh, just quickly comment? Well, you know, as a historian, I tend to be very pessimistic because I see all kinds of examples <laughs> and I see a lot of a lot of similarities uh, between what happens now and what, what happened in 30s and uh, especially with, with Japan and in, 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 in China. So I, I'm not optimistic. I, I would say we will have two blocks and uh, toward, I won't say a third world war because I don't want it to happen, but it's very, very serious situation. And I think we will all feel the repercussion of it on major levels, even here in Canada, although we are very far from, from the main theater. Um, thank you. Thank you, Olga. Uh, Yun, your final words? Well, I think, I think that might be the most intuitive answer that yes, we're going to divide into two, we're going to split into two worlds. Um, but if you look at the details, and I can't help but ask the question, what does it look like? That now we see that Russia being cut out of the international financial system, that Russia will end up at the international pariah by the end of this, by the end of this war. But does that apply to China too? I think the answer on that is going to be much more obscure than just a simple yes or no, because the level of China's economic integration with the rest of the world is much higher than Russia. And China as a primary trading partner for most countries in the, for most countries in the world, I think that's just very hard to say that, okay, we're going to bundle China and Russia together, label them as authoritarian regimes, and then we're going to isolate them from now on. Well, the complex interdependence of the economics do not work that way. Um, so I think what will be more interesting is that now the Western countries are taking measures to diminish for example, their energy vulnerabilities, their energy dependence on Russia. I think it will be curious to see whether the same is going to happen to on, their, on China as well, that we are going to deliberately limit or diminish our dependence on China for trade and also calculate the cost that we have to pay for it. So I think, yes, on Russia, there I do see there is a very strong, unanimous um, and consolidated international coalition especially for the Western countries against Russia. But I think on China, the answer is going to be much more complicated. Thank you. Well, thank you, Yun. And um, that was truly an illuminating discussion. There's so much expertise and, and rich perspectives um, um, from our panel. So a big thank you to our speakers, Olga, Yun, and Gordon for sharing your insight with us today. We will continue to monitor this evolving international crisis and China's role in it. We truly hope um, a peaceful resolution could be found soon to end the suffering of the Ukrainian people. Uh, our Institute, um, by the way, on April the 7th, will host another virtual talk, vir virtual research talk on a different topic, uh, assessing the effectiveness of international organizations naming and shaming China when it comes to alleged human rights uh, violations by uh, Professor Reza Hasmas at the University of Alberta. Please stay tuned for more information. Um, I would um, like to thank um, all the audience members today for joining us. Uh, do enjoy the rest of your day and have a great weekend. Thank you.